Yeah, that, that always messes me up for, for at least this a few morning, weeks. I was trying to figure out, do I go here at 8 or 9? Right. All right. Um, we left off last time talking about, and we put some validators on the page. We put, uh, I don't remember exactly which ones. I think we put a couple of validators on, on the page. Um, let's talk a minute about them. All right. Um, first of all, you all could write the code to validate it. I'm sure in your 160 class you wrote code to validate stuff, all right? Um, but why would it be better to use the ASP.NET validation control as opposed to writing your own validation? There's a couple of pretty good reasons why. Okay, people that work for, at Microsoft developed that. What does that mean? Does that mean that, that are there superhumans that work at Microsoft? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I would argue that. Right. It's proven. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, for one, there's, you know, is a virtual certainty that that code was tested more thoroughly than you would test your code. All right. So. That does not mean to say that it is impossible to find bugs in it, but well, you're still going to get blamed. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, it's you still will get blamed because again, it's your job. You know, it's a poor carpenter that blames a hammer or, or wherever it goes. So, even if it is a bug with that, it's your job to test it and to find any issues. But the point is, is those have been thoroughly tested. Those have been tested better than you would likely test your code. So that's one solid reason for using them. What would another reason for using them be? Save time that you, yeah, that you don't spend Yeah, time. save time, right? Um, some of the validation is pretty simple, but you know, if there's a tool that will take care of a few simple tasks that you have, that's great because that saves your time then for the more complex and more involved tasks and maybe the tasks that are more specific to your problem as opposed to the very general ones. So first and foremost is that they save time. They probably will be, uh, probably are more reliable. The other thing kind of associated with reliable is if you collectively do it, you're addressing things in a consistent manner, which is always good. So if, if Two of you, you know, if I assign two of you to write a little routine to validate phone numbers or dates, let's say, or anything, there's a chance that you would do it in a slightly different way. And I don't mean a slightly different way in terms of the actual code. I'm talking about in terms of functionality. For example, maybe one person would write the telephone uh, number uh, that would handle international phone numbers, and the other person would just write it to handle uh, U.S. phone numbers. Or maybe one person would write it um, where the area code was optional, and another person would write it where the area code is required, or something along those lines. So if you use a validation control, um, you're going to guarantee it's going to be handled in a consistent way. And if your team uses it, um, you know, you could be working at, in, in a variety of contexts. You could be the sole developer working on something, or you could be part of a team. Well, when you work as part of a team, consistency is important. And uh, therefore, you know, if you use the validation controls, you guarantee it. Now, there's another advantage that's a little more subtle. And we're going to take a second to talk about that. And you wouldn't necessarily know it unless you spent, either you read about it or you spent some time playing with it. Where should validation occur within a web application? Through client-side code or server-side code? Server? We have another answer. Why not both? Why not both? All right. Let's talk a little bit about validation and about where it occurs. All right. What is the advantage of doing stuff on the client side? And specifically, when I talk about stuff in this context, I'll talk about validation. Let's say I have a form to enter in, and I'm validating to make sure there's required fields. What's the advantage of doing it client side? You don't have to set it out to the server. You don't have to set it out to the server. And what, how is that a good thing? You don't have to wait for that server. Pardon me? You can save bandwidth. Okay. Yeah, number one, I heard a couple of things. Number one is 
Uh, what did you say, Jesse? I didn't say it. I said Someone it. said it. Okay. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. Yeah. Right. But on the client side, you don't have to wait for a response. In other words, if I have a form to enter in with my name, credit card number, and email address, if I put in my name and not the credit card number, if the validation was done strictly on the, on the server side, we'd have to take the bandwidth to go all the way to the internet, have the server process it, and send back a message saying, hey, you forgot your credit card number. If that is done client side, if that client side code is downloaded, when the initial web page is downloaded, then it's instantaneous. It doesn't have to go anywhere. The validation can happen immediately on the client side. So doing validation on the client side is a good thing, all right, because people get a quick response. To do the food analogy again, all right, remember we were doing food analogies for client and server scripting, or, or at least for server-side scripting. Client-side scripting is like putting salt and, and pepper and ketchup and hot sauce on your table at the restaurant. You let the client deal with it so you don't have to flag the server down every time you want to sprinkle a salt on your fries, right? That would be a pain for everyone. You'd have to wait for the server to respond for you, and the server simply, um, you know, would be bothered with a constant stream of requests. And that brings up the other advantage. If, there's, if there is form data that is being sent that you know is wrong, that cannot possibly be correct, such as you are placing an order and you're not supplying a credit card number. There's no way that that can process. There's no way the server should be able to process that. So why burden the server with a request that it can't possibly successfully complete, right? So it's a win-win situation. The client gets a quicker response. The server is not bothered with these requests that, by definition, can't be processed. All right. So the question was raised. Uh, the question. So, so there's a there's an advantage about doing validation on the client side for those two reasons. What about the 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 the, the uh, it was mentioned to do it both on the client and server. If we're going to do it on the client side, why would we do it on the server side? Could you repeat that after you <laughs> finished your delightful snack here? These are good cookies. <laughs> In case anything got messed up. In case anything got messed up, uh, such as messed up how? Somehow a credit card number, even though it's like encrypted. You know, got yeah, I, I suppose that's a possibility. In case somehow the data didn't get over there correct. I, I suppose a possibility. Any other reason? There's one like, there's, there's one reason that's like the absolute trumps everything else. Sorry for using that word in class. <laughs> Is it for manageability? Manageability, maintainability? Not really. If anything, this is a case where we're doing work on both sides, so we're actually, we're actually increasing our work. All right, the reason is, is you can turn off in your browser client-side scripting. You can go and disable JavaScript. All right? Now, how many people do that? How many people know what JavaScript, when I talk about people, I don't mean people in this class, but the general public. How many people even know what JavaScript is or what it does or what it means to disable it? Not many. However, you know, it would be horrible if someone trying to either intentionally or unintentionally manipulate the system all right, would turn off their JavaScript so the client-side scripting would be disabled, all right, and then be able to submit a, an order on the, uh, to the server with an invalid or missing credit card number. All right, that, that wouldn't be a good thing. Or little Billy drop tables. Exactly, or little Billy drop tables, right, exactly. Uh, things like that. So therefore, because you can disable client-side scripting, you repeat that same validation on the server side. This is one case where redundant code is okay, all right? Because it's not truly redundant. Each of the, each of the pieces of code that does the validation serves a role. 
Now, there's a part B to this uh, question, too. And that is there's some kinds of validation that can only be performed on the server side. For example, I could write validation on the client side to look and make sure that the credit card number field was entered. I could make sure that it was all numbers. I could make sure that it was the right number of digits. I think MasterCards and Visas are 15 numbers and American Express are 16, something like that. There's a certain number of digits that valid credit card numbers have. So I could validate that. But I could not validate on the client side whether the credit card was a valid number or someone just didn't type in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or something like that. I could not validate whether that credit card was reported stolen. I could not validate to, to, uh, that the, the name on the credit card matches the name that was typed in or the zip code or that little um, three digit number that's on the back of the card. All right? Or that it was stolen or that it was over its limit or whatever. Those are more extensive validations which aren't simply the kind of validations where you're looking at a form and checking to see if the form, if the data looks good. Here you're actually doing some processing with it. And that would require interacting with a database or some sort of service, some sort of other web service, let's say that someone else process, like maybe your bank. Remember, on the client side, you're limited to the resources that you can access. Now, you can do things quickly, and you can do validation in terms of making sure it looks correct, but to do the more extensive validation that's required, um, that would involve database interactivity and so on, you would require that being submitted to the server. All right, so you're going to have at least the same validation on the client and server, and possibly more on the server for things that can't be validated on the client. Now, what does this have to do with ASP.NET controls? What this has to do with is, is a couple of things. Number one, The use of validation controls. Validation controls both generate JavaScript and generate server-side code. So if I make a field required, that field will be checked on the client and on the server. All right? And that's a good thing. That way you don't have to write redundant code. You write the one validation control and if client-side scripting is enabled, then JavaScript validation will validate the form. If the browser disables client-side scripting, the validation will still occur, but it will occur on the server-side code. All right? So that's, that's a win-win situation. So let's download the example we looked at the, uh, last time, and let's look at some of these things, and let's look at some of the adjustments we'd have to make to that code because of what we described. the example from last time.
Okay. Downloaded the zip file. I will extract that. It's actually extracted into a folder within a folder. So when I go and open it up, I have to make it to the folder that contains the web config file. By the way, I had inadvertently um, posted an old version of the assignment and a new version of the assignment. So I disabled the one that was not valid. All right. Um, a tip off to you that it was not valid is it was due August 30th. All right. So um, if you saw that, which a couple people saw over the weekend and were disturbed, um, don't worry about that. It's the right things are enabled now. Amazing thing is, I like I. Well, obviously I don't. I was gonna say I check these things. I look at them to make sure that they're correct, and yet things still slip by, which is which is a scary thought. Anyhow, Zeller's ran a truck company. Notice I don't see the web. I notice there's a folder underneath it, so I'm going to open that because that's the folder that contains the web config file. I go and try to run this. go and calculate bill. Watch. Notice a couple things. Notice you won't see the status flicker. You won't see the page flicker because this is all happening client side. I click calculate bill and instantly I see must enter miles. Notice if I enter in something that's not numeric, I get a different message. Now notice that this message is pushed over. We'll look at how we can handle that in a second so that we don't push the messages over. Um, essentially, the other error message takes up a certain amount of space whether the error message is there or not. All right? And so we're going to change it so that if the error message isn't there, it doesn't take up the space. I guess the point that I'm trying to illustrate is that this is um, happening on the client side because it happens immediately. All right? If I go in and I put a number in, and calculate, I get the result. Now let's go and see if we can disable JavaScript. All right. Internet options, that would be my guess. Security. I, I'm looking for this, so, so don't. JavaScript.
tell you what. How can we test this in Chrome? Because I think I can find it in Chrome. Yeah, you could start it in Chrome, but once it's already started, we could copy the URL and fire up Chrome. Um, let's see, settings. Advanced settings, content settings. There we go. And do not allow any site to run JavaScript. So I'll click done. All right. So now I have this. What happens if I click calculate bill now? The JavaScript didn't fire up. Right? And notice what it's doing. It's contacting my web server. So because I disabled the JavaScript, it's contacting my web server. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to blow up because I haven't specified the miles in there. All right. So I thought I said that our code fires off on the server side. It does. But what we have to put in is we have to put in a catch to say, hey, if the server side finds an error, don't go ahead and continue to process this. So, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to put in the button click event if is valid. And what does that mean? That means if all the validation controls have passed. There we go. All right. So that is checking to see if all the validation controls are passed. Now, when I go and run it in Chrome with JavaScript disabled, it will still send it to the server, but this little catch will keep it from trying to process it further, and we will see the appropriate error message. So let's go and run this. We can choose that we want to run it in Chrome. Start debug. And if I go and calculate it, it's going to go to the server. We're going to see it go to the server, but we're going to get our validation error. There we go. Must enter miles. All right, verse and or must enter number. So let me go and re-enable JavaScript. So this little snippet of code should be in every submit button that you have, any code behind for a submit button that you have. If is valid. It should just be at the top of every one. And you can put it on there even if you don't have any validation. Just get in the habit of doing it. That way if at a later time you add validation, um, you'll check it. And again, in essence, what this does is, is this prevents it from going any further if the server side validation catches an error. All right. Now, if we had more extensive validation on the, on the server side, we could put a function call here to call and do the other validation. That is, make sure the credit card had not expired or was not reported as stolen or whatever. But we could do that there. All right questions about any of this. 
The too long didn't read version of this part of the lecture is put an if statement in every button click event that says if is valid and wrap your code up in that if statement. If you're interested in the details, the reason for that is because you don't want to generate any further errors. You don't want to have any uh, issues if the validation did not pass on the server side. You want to, you, if the validation did not pass on the server side, you want to stop the presses and not continue on processing the request. All right, let's do a little bit of cleanup here. And let's put those messages, let's change it so the messages do not appear with a gap between them. Notice again, if the must enter a number pops up, it appears over a little bit. That's because this takes up that space regardless of whether it is displayed or not. So you can simply do that by saying display instead of static, say the display is dynamic. So, when I run this now, if that isn't, if, if I don't have that error, that error message doesn't take up any space. So, if I go and put garbage in now, that appears right alongside of it, rather than it used to appear like over here somewhere. And that's generally a good thing to do, all right, uh, to make the... Uh, to make the error messages dynamic. Because usually when you have a situation like that, you have um, several errors that could occur, but they're not all going to occur. All right? So therefore, you want the one that, that has occurred to be like right up next to the, 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 the text box that has a problem. All right. Size, uh, uh, what else could we validate about the number of miles? Well, we can make sure that the number of miles wasn't a negative, and we can make sure that the number of miles was um, um, less than a certain reasonable amount. Um, you know, I don't know what, what would be a reasonable amount for a rental truck. Maybe you could take it cross country. That would be 3,000 some miles, all right? Maybe you could take it across country and back. For the sake of argument, in this case, we're going to um, validate to make sure that the number of miles is between 1 and 10,000. All right? You could argue that maybe 0 and 500 would be a better one, but we're just going to validate the range of 1 to 10,000. So, that is done with a different kind of validator. Let's look at the kind of validators we've used so far, and let's look at some of the other validation controls. So far we have used a required field validator. That simply makes sure that there's something in the field. We've then used a compare validator to make sure that the value is numeric. You use a compare validator for two things. One is to make sure that one value is So, later on when we enter in a date range, there's going to be a starting date and an ending date. We know that the starting date can't be after the ending date. All right? So, we're going to use a compare validator to make sure that the ending date is equal to or greater than the starting date. So, that's one, re one way we can use a compare validator. The other way we use a compare validator is to compare up against a data type. So we use the compare validator to make sure that the value we entered was numeric. All right. We're now going to use a range validator. And the range validator, you give an allowable range for the value. And you make sure that the, the value is within a certain range. All right. So I'll go and put a range validator here. I'm going to change this guy to say display dynamic. And the range validator, I'm going to configure
My error message, I'm going to say, must be between 1 and 10,000. I have to specify, as I do with all of these validation controls, oops, what control I'm validating. And I'm validating TXT miles. I have to specify what type of data I'm validating. So it's a double. And then lastly, I have to specify the lowest allowable value and the highest allowable value. Be careful with this because if you have it displayed in, in alphabetical order, it shows maximum and then minimum. So. You know, if you're thinking 1 to 10,000, it's actually going to be 10,000 to 1. Why do you have to specify the type of data when you compare to see if something's in a range? Well, because there's different rules about what constitutes a range depending, depending if you're looking at a string, a date, or a number. Let's talk about a number first. What number is bigger? So now I run it. And if I try to be tricky and put in negative 10 miles, it tells me it has to be within 1 in 10,000. If I put in a really high number, it has to be within 1 in 10,000. If I put in, whoops a reasonable number, then it goes and does a calculation. 
Now notice, and this gets a little frustrating, all right, but it's not that big of a deal. Notice that this one control has three validators on it, all right? Actually, we could probably get rid of the numeric validation now that we put in the range validation. All right? But still, it's possible to have a couple validations per form field. All right? Like, you might think, like, that's kind of dumb, and, and that's, that's uh, you know, why do I have to do that? Well, you do, right? Someone's doing your work for you, so quit complaining. All right. The second thing is, is that if you think about it, there may be cases where a field, a validation rule only applies if there's value entered into it. For example, phone number. You might make the phone number an optional field that they don't have to enter it. So it's not required. But if you do enter something in the phone number field, you want to make sure it's a valid phone number. So therefore, if it's a required field, you'd have two, two validators on it, a required validator and a regular expression validator, which we'll talk about in a minute here. If it was um, not required, you'd only have the regular expression validator. So someone could enter nothing, but if they entered something, it would have to fit the pattern for a valid phone number. Okay, we have not covered two of the validators. Custom validator, that's where you want to validate it, but none of these other things apply. There's some quirky validation that you need to perform that isn't addressed in any of the other validators. In which case, that just gives you a hook so that you could put in your own validation function and do the validation. The other validation is a regular expression validator. And that's to make sure that a field that you enter in fits a certain pattern. All right? So let's just for a laugh, let's put an email address on this form. So I'll put a text box, I'll put a label here and a text box. For email. Again, notice how I can change this stuff here, or I can change it through the properties window. Either way, it's going to get changed. All right. If I put on here a regular expression validator, again, I have to specify the control I want to validate. which is txt email. I have to specify a error message. Then I have to specify a regular expression. Expression at the top. Oh, okay. No, that's not it. Okay. Validation expression. Now, there's a list of predefined things, the kind of things that you typically would want to validate. German phone number, German postal code, 
French phone number and postal code, blah, 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 blah. Internet email address is one of them. Regular expressions do not have anything to do with C-sharp or they're, they're a language into himself and, and they're used in a lot of, uh, a lot of programming contexts. They're a way of describing patterns. So this is the way that you describe what an email address looks like, believe it or not, using the regular expression. What does an email address consist of? Well, an email address is some letters, maybe some punctuation. You can have underscores and periods, but not other punctuations. There's going to be an at sign, and there's going to be a domain name. What's a domain name? Some characters, a dot, and then an upper level domain. That's essentially what this says, except it says it in an airtight way, right? Um, because the way I described it um, was a very loose, informal way, and you could probably find some loopholes. This, this describes what an email address is comprised of in a very vigorous way, all right? Because really, to write an email address validator is a pain to write. You could all do it, but it would take a long time. You're going to have bugs in it, and so on and so forth. So there's some pre-written things, a URL. You know, you could uh, for someone, you know, you could allow someone to put in a URL and validate that it was a valid form of a URL. US phone number, US social security number, US zip code, and so on. Now, one thing good with regular expressions is you can come up with your own. All right. Why would you do that? Well, think maybe your um, company has a rule for their part numbers. All right. Maybe your part numbers are all of the form three letters followed by four numbers. So ABC1234 is a valid part number. So you could create a regular expression that says it has to be three letters followed by four numbers. And I'm sure there's tutorials online that would tell you how to do that and you could figure out how to do it. Now, whether that was a valid part number, that would be something you'd have to validate on the server because you'd have to check the database and so on. But you could at very least validate that the form of the part number could be correct. All right. But we're just going to use email address here. And so if we run this, and we put in something, if I put in nothing, what happens? It doesn't give me an error. Why not? Well, again, if I wanted to validate it's a valid email num uh, address and there was something entered in it, then I would have to put a required validator too. All right. So this allows me to make it optional. So they don't have to put anything in it, but if they do put something in it, it has to be a valid email address. So now if I go and try to put in just some garbage, it will tell me must enter a valid email address. All right, and then it's okay. All right. The last thing we have to validate is the size of truck. What kind of validator do you think we need for that? Some box is checked. Which validator do you think will best do that? Pardon me? Required field. Yeah, we simply, they simply have to do something in this box. So that's a required field. So I'll go and I'll put required field up here. I know what I 
did wrong, though. I think I know what I did wrong. Initial value. questions on any of this. Let's go and review the code in the code behind. It's pretty simple, but we're going to start making it more complex in a minute here. Okay, we decided we're going to hard code the number of days to start out as being one. We did that. We could, we, sometimes this is called as a stub function. And we'll see what I mean by a stub function in a minute here. All right? Um, or a few minutes here. I can actually calculate the number of days. All right? How do you calculate the number of days? Well, first of all, you know the starting date, you know the ending date. All right. How do you calculate that? You subtract the first day from the last day. All right. That's correct. If you had to write that from scratch, how would you do that? Well, if it's the same month and the same year, you simply subtract the date from the date. So if I was comparing September 3rd with September 4th of 2016, the month and the day and the year are the same, I just subtract the day from the day. It gets trickier when you go between months. You had your hand up? How would you say? Okay. All right. Both of what you're saying is getting on, on the right track here. The hope is that we don't have to calculate that, that there will be something already in the language that will do that for us. All right. That either there's a calendar control that we could use or that there is something that we could use that would allow us to calculate the starting, uh, the, the difference between the starting date and ending date. Because really, it's, it's tricky to do that when you consider all the things that you have to do, right? Um, for example, if you wanted to calculate the difference between October 1st and September 30th, well, you'd have to know that uh, September only has 30 days, so that's only one day. Whereas the difference between Octo uh, uh, October 30th and November 1st would be two days, right? Because October has 31 days. So you have to know how many days are in each month, all right? You would have to know what to do if it crosses over a year. You'd have to know what to do in the case of a leap year. So writing a date difference function, not saying it's difficult, but it would take a little bit of time. And again, guess what? Yours is not going to be as well tested as the one that's built in. So we're going to hope that there's some sort of data arithmetic here, all right? And so that's, that's, what, what our, that's what our strategy is going to be, to look for some build-in function. And if you think about it, that is reasonable. Because what does a framework, what is a framework meant to do? It's, it's meant to provide a jumping off point. It's meant to provide a starting point something to build on. And how does it do that? It does that by taking common things that you are going to do and making them easy. 
Well, if you think about it, there's a lot of applications need to know the differences between two dates, right? And therefore, a lot of applications is going to need that sort of date arithmetic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google date arithmetic C sharp. and see how to do it. to me like this is what we need to do. Let's go in and let's add our two fields to our form. For now, we're going to skip validation. We'll come back and we will add validation later. For now, we are just going to assume that we're going to play nice and put in validates. And again, are you allowed to do that? Sure you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to attack your problem a little bit at a time, provided you come back and finish the job. and dot the I's and cross the T's. <laughs> So let's go and let's grab that snippet of code. I'm going to go my code behind. And I'm going to 
to say number of days now equals, this isn't going to work. I'm tipping you guys off to that. txt and minus txt Okay, whoops, dot text. So I'm grabbing the, the text uh, box of the ending date, the value of the text box for the ending date. I'm grabbing the value of the text box for the starting date. I'm subtracting them and I'm asking for the number of days. Why is it giving me an error? Was, does that mean that this is wrong? Okay, exactly right. And if we look at the squiggly line, it will tell us something along the lines that, um, hey, um, whoops, actually in this case it's that. Okay, now we got a different squiggly line. We got one big squiggly line instead of two little ones. The reason I had the first little one is there's no property called text with a lowercase t. Text is with an uppercase t. So once I fix that, now I got one big squiggly line. And what it's telling me is I can subtract strings. Now I know that these are going to be days, yet a text box, and I could even at some point validate them to make sure they're, they are dates, but the compiler doesn't know that I'm going to force these to be dates. The compiler only knows that you could have a string in that field. So what do we have to do? Pardon me? Okay. Well, I don't want I don't want a number either. What do I want? What do I want to do with that? How do I want to treat these fields in these text boxes? I want to treat them like what? Dates. Like dates. So I have a string, and I want to treat it like a date. So I have to turn the string into a date. So how do I do that? What's the problem here? Pardon me? No, I, I have all the parentheses. It's a double. No, but you're close. You're real, real close. I'm trying to put a double into an end. The number of, the difference between dates is a double. Wow, what does that mean? That means one and a half. 1.2, 1.8, 5.3 are all valid values. How can there be 5.3 days between this day and that day? Because you're including time. Right, because every date is actually a date time. So I could be comparing 6 a.m. on September 4th with noon on September 5th. That would be 1.25 days. Well, in this case, 
I, I want to um, I want to um, make sure that that's an integer. All right. And if I'm not mistaken, when I read days, actually returns an integer. So it will truncate it and give me the whole number of days. Now, are we done? Does this work? Who knows? All right. What could be a potential problem with this? It's a standard problem that you run into all the time in programming when you deal with dates. Or actually not just with dates, but dates is a good example of it. Yes? The formatting of it, maybe. Or maybe related to the formatting. Well, what's the difference between September 4th, 2016 and September 4th, 2016? If I subtracted those, how many days should I get? Zero. If I'm a truck rental company, if someone borrows it today and returns it today, do I want to charge them for zero days? No, I want to charge them for one day. So whether it counts... And it depends on like the kind of calculation you're doing, right? For truck rental companies, zero days is actually one day. If you're looking at, if you have a library book that's due in 30 days, well, then the first day doesn't count, right? It's, it's, you would add 30 days onto it. So there's always a problem in programming of like, is it plus or minus one, you know? So you would have to test that. Let's test that and see what happens, and then let's adjust it. All right. Now, I don't have any validation on dates, but we can try let's put it nine four to nine four thirty three miles a small truck. Twenty-four seventy-five. Is that correct? Well, small truck is should be what? Should be. I remember our code should be twenty dollars, and then we are charging seventy-five cents per miles. So, what would seventy-five cents times thirty-three be? educational experience where I pretend not to know what I did wrong um, so that we can discover it together. Or you can simply say that after a four-day weekend, I'm a little rusty and I put something in wrong. It's up to you to decide. Now, we're going to talk about the right and wrong way to figure this out. Let's talk about the wrong way first. And the wrong way is a way that most beginning programmers debug. And what is that wrong way? I'm going to open up this code and I'm going to stare at it. So we could stare at it for a while. 
could you imagine if that you went to a doctor and you said that my knee hurts? The doctor said, let's see your knee. So you, you, know, you put your leg up, up there. And the doctor just stared at it for a while. Just stared. Well, that's not a really good strategy for figuring it out, right? What do you want the doctor to do? You want your doctor to get in there, to do some x-rays, to do an MRI, to apply a systematic approach. And not, or even worse, the other approach a doctor could have is like, well, let's try this. Let's try wrapping it up with an ace bandage and see if you feel better. All right, so let's wrap it up, go walk around for a couple weeks, come back and tell me if it's better. Or if that doesn't work, let's put a different kind of brace on it. Or let's give you a shot of this. Or whatever, right? None of those are good approaches. Either just staring at it and thinking about it and seeing what you could come up with. Or haphazardly trying stuff is not a good approach. And those are the two approaches that typically beginning programmers take. And honestly, those are the two approaches that even more experienced programmers take. Let's try something and see if it works. Now, here's where I'm going to talk about the good old days as a programmer. All right? Back in the good old days, when I programmed on punch cards, all right, I had a stack of cards, you would put them in the computer, it would read through the cards, and you would get your results back in a few hours, or maybe like that, or maybe the next day. Well, guess what? If you haphazardly just tried something and found that it didn't work, that put you back a day in your efforts. So you weren't going to haphazardly. You're going to try to think it through. Well, how do you think it through? Try a systematic approach. And we would actually go and would pretend we were the computer and would actually have a, a scratch pad for all our variables and and write, well, like, at this point, x equals 0, at this point, x equals 1, you know, and so on. Fortunately for us, we have what's called a debugger. All right? And a debugger allows, it's like an x-ray or like a MRI, where we can actually get into the code and see what's going on. So I'm going to go and I'm going to click here, and I'm going to set what's called a breakpoint. When the, when the, when the server hits a breakpoint, it shows you line by line the lines of codes that are executed, the lines of code that is executed, and you can go and look at and you can see at each step are the values of the variables what I expect them to be. So let's try this. I guarantee in any of, our, uh, um, any of uh, the assignments, if you tell me you have a problem with something, I'm going to first ask you if you run it through the debugger. So let's go and debug this. So I'll go put in 9 for 2016. 9 for 2016. Number of miles 33. Calculate that. There we are. Here's where we're at, the lines of code. This shows us the value of our variables down here. And it shows us the value before this instruction is executed. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say step into. So it went and it calculated it. And after it calculated, I can either hover my mouse or I can look down here, number of days equals zero. All right. Which I think someone predicted. I can then say step into, number of miles, step into again. equals 33. That's correct. If RB selected value equals S, then rate equals 20. So 
So rate equals 20. So we're down here. Cost equals rate times number of my up days. 20 times 0 days plus number of miles times 75. Cost is 24.75. And so it shows 24.75. So you were correct. It's not counting the number of days. How do we fix that? Because it said the difference between today and today was zero days, which is logical, right? Plus one. Plus one. Sure. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say plus one. Now I'll go and run this and Now I'm assuming that they're only counting whole numbers of days. They might have a rule that like if it is up to 12 hours it counts as a half day. In which case you could write some logic in there that would actually look at the fractional amount of a day and not just the integer. Pardon me? Thank you. Oh, oh, I, okay. I, I, I heard you say mix the four and a two. I thought you just meant I typed a two instead of a four, but I put the four in the wrong place. Okay, there we go. Calculate bill. All right. I can then debug it and look and say, oh, now number of days is one. I could continue debugging it if I want to, but now I'm pretty confident that it's going to work. So I'm just going to say continue. And it shows me 4475, which I think is the right answer. The message of this, when you debug, take a systematic approach. Don't take either the haphazard approach where you just wildly change things, or the approach of staring at it, hoping that the error jumps out at you. The other thing that you would want to test is you would want to actually pencil and paper test this. This was obvious it was wrong. Well. I don't know if it was obvious it was wrong. I did the calculation by hand. All right? One day would be a great test case to have, just because as a programmer, I'm aware of that plus or minus one day. Would this be the only thing that you would test? No. I would test what if you take it and return it back the same day? What if you take it and return it back the next day? What if you take it the end of the month and return it the following month? You could, and, and again, all these for different numbers of miles and for small, medium, and large. So you would want to develop a test plan. These are the things I'm going to test, and these are the results that I, I, I expect to get. And then when you go back and make changes to the code, you can go back and test it to make sure that everything worked okay. Now, we now have, well, we have to put validation on these things, all right? So we, we still have a little bit more work to do here. But other than that, is that the only thing that we have left to do with this, is a validation? You can almost guess the answer is no. All right. Here's an important thing that I try to stress in all my classes. Just because a program works doesn't mean it's good. All right. And therefore, we can look at taking and improving our code, and that process is known as refactoring. And we can talk about next time, and we'll go over some examples, and we'll go over ways of making this better, but you can bet that what makes a piece of code better than another piece of code is the maintainability of it.
All right, so we'll talk about like what we could do to make this code better. All right, and why it makes it better, and then we'll go on from there. All right, I'm going to go and uh, open the lab, then I'll come back here and.